to get started with Planetarium Live. Tonight's going to be a little bit different, but still fun. No doubt. It feels like I haven't streamed anything for a week. It's actually been a week and a half. <laughs> I have my one viewer tuning in. Thank you, Heather, <laughs> for saying hello. Even if I was talking to nobody, I would still do it. We're not going to see me tonight because uh, I'm actually getting my camera ready to go outside and look for this comet and take some photos. And so instead, you get to hear my, my voice with some added grit and uh, a, a shield, like a I don't know if you call it a spit shield, but one of those things that prevents a lot of those hard S's from hitting the microphone. So it sounds a little bit more uh, chill and more radio voice tonight than your typical me yelling at the camera stream. But we're going to do some fun stuff. I'm going to talk about the comet and we're going to take a look at a comet in Space Engine. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that you can see this summer in the night sky. And we're going to go visit them in Space Engine, which is going to be really fun. So we're going to use Stellarium, we're going to use Space Engine, and we're just going to start talking about the universe. So let's start with Stellarium. Uh, this is, as you can see, I've selected the new comet that's up in the sky, C2020 F3 Neowise. I actually wrote a, a really um, a blog post about how to find Neowise using Stellarium um, on your desktop. So you can actually get Stellarium for free at stellarium.org. But there's a special way to add in the comet data uh, so that you can see Neowise. And I think it, it got quite a few hits, which was really nice. It was nice to see people coming and checking it out and actually finding it uh, a useful resource. But, um, but this is where the comet is tonight at about 9.44 p.m. So I'm going to be outside trying to photograph it, hence why my camera is not quite available right now. But the comet is setting, you know, so it's following the sun. So um, as we let time go forward, you'll see that it's going to start to set. And so it's only going to be up tonight until, well, quite late, actually, as the sky kind of turns. So it'll be out very low in the sky, like you can see the, um, oh, what's the height above the horizon? It's one of these numbers up here. <laughs> we have to find which one. It's probably one of the ones that's changing. That's okay. It's probably the hour angle. So it is slowly working its way down, but it's really low on the horizon right now. Um, however, it'll be dark enough to actually see. Its magnitude is uh, nine and a half, which is it's not bad. Not quite visible, but a little bit below that. If you have dark skies, you should be able to see it. No problem. Yeah, question in the chat. Does the iPhone app work for it? Unfortunately, it doesn't. I have the um, the Android app of Stellarium, and it doesn't actually seem to work uh, to get the comet. So I actually had to use my desktop version. However, there is apparently a web version of Stellarium, and, uh, and so that it does apparently show the comet. And yeah, the comet is starting to fade. Every day it's getting a little bit further away from the sun, which means there's there's less sunlight to reflect off of it to start causing those gases and dust to liberate from it. And it, like if you look at our uh, target there, you can't really see the comet there. But if we go to tomorrow, it's a little bit higher up. Next day, it's a little bit higher up. It's actually slowly leaving the solar system. And I'm actually going to bring up, um, while I'm thinking of it, uh, there's a, a guy I, I follow who does some really good um, comet stuff. And I'm going to bring up his, his page. This is the one. So I use this, this website to follow all the comets that I watch. Not like I, I watch a lot of comets, but here we are watching this one. Um, and it's kind of cool because you can see the track of, of where the comet is, where the Earth is. Um, and actually, it is still approaching the Earth. So even though it's going further from the sun, it will get a little bit dimmer. The closest approach to Earth, I think, is the 23rd. Oh, yeah, there it is. Nearest approach, July 23rd. Uh, right up there. Uh, in the chat, Kaluna Carbon, there is an app I can suggest, but I think it's iOS only. It's called Comet Neowise. Well, I wonder if 
the maker, Hanno Rain, made it just for this comet. Who knows? I'm sure it would apply to a bunch of other comets too, though, so that's kind of cool. But um, there's lots of good ways to find it. So there you go. Here's the comet heading out of the solar system now. And so over time, it will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Um, and so if we come back to Stellarium, you know, you can see it over the next few nights are going to be really good, especially because tonight is clear and tomorrow is clear. It's going to be really good. It gets a bit higher up. You should be able to see it in the dark. I'm going to go out tonight, which is the 17th, so i got to go a couple days ahead. There we go. So that's back to today, and you can you can go out and see it. Um, there's a lot of other stuff in the sky, but I'm going to actually show you what the comet looks like using Space Engine. Uh, the comet we're looking at, uh, let's bring it up here. So this is Space Engine, and this is the uh, this is actually the comet Hale Bop um, that I, I was using uh, some footage of this recently um, for one of the Astro Views episodes. I think Heather, you know which one. And uh, and so I actually went back in time to 1997 when the comet was really really close to Earth and looked really really good. Um, and so what you know what makes a comet look really good is that it's getting closer and closer to the sun. And as you'd expect here, you can see kind of the the sun is blowing the tails of the comet toward us. And I said comet tails because comets do have two tails. They have this whiter dusty tail and this blue ionized gas tail. Um, comets are basically like big dirty snowballs. If you imagine some of that snow that you pick up in March or April when you know everything's melting and there's sand and everything on what's left of the snow and you make a snowball out of that, that's what a comet is, except they're several kilometers wide. They're pretty big. Uh, and so Comet Hale Bop was a pretty big one, but um, as, the, as they get closer to the sun, the sunlight blasts away a lot of the ice and, and dust and releases trapped gases. And so when it gets close, it heats up, all that stuff starts to fly away and it leaves these tails behind. Now the tail of gas, the blue one, gases are really, 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 really light. And so the sunlight actually blasts away the gas directly away from the sun. So the, the ion tail, the blue tail of the comet always points away from the sun, no matter which way the comet is moving. The white tail, on the other hand, dust is a little bit heavier, and so uh, it actually tends to trail a little bit behind the, the direction the comet's moving. So you can use the white tail to kind of take a look and say, oh, it's it's kind of pointing away from, it's it's also pointing away from the sun, but it's it's pointing uh, a little bit behind the comet in the direction it's traveling. So it's it's always a little bit off of the the perfectly flat, straight ion tail. Um, but one of the cool things about Space Engine is that everything's actually rendered. So we can go and zoom right in on this. And we're going to slow down quite a bit because we're, we're going in close. You can see in the, the top corner, the top left corner, we're a distance of about 3 million kilometers from it. Um, this, is, this is called the coma, the, the part, the bright spot at the very head of the comet. Um, and it's a kind of an elongated area where all that dust and, and ice and melted stuff is, is forming like a big cloud. And so as we go in closer, we're actually going to see that the comet itself is really, really, really tiny. Um, in the chat, Luna Carbon, is this a web program or something we need to download? Space Engine. Space Engine is software. Um, it's not free. I think it costs about $40. Um, and then there's a commercial version that's um, a bit more expensive, but uh, it's really fun. Like it, it simulates the whole universe, and you're going to see some of the things we can do as we take a look at this. Uh, not just the comet, but some of the other things that we're going to look at today. And I'm actually doing a lot of streaming using Space Engine lately. I'm using it in all my videos because it's really fun to um, simulate what's going on up in the sky and, uh, and kind of film it, so to speak. So here we go. We're going in really, really, really close. And we're starting to finally see a bit of the shape of, of Comet Hale Bop, which you're going to see is kind of that big, dirty snowball look. But it's just a dot right now. We're going in closer. We're still 14,000 kilometers away. So let's go a bit closer. And here we go. This is what a typical comet looks like. I guess they call it a cool asteroid. Um, asteroids and comets aren't that different, really. Um, comets tend to be a lot icier, but they also tend to have these really long orbits where, um, you know, when we looked at the... Uh, the web page, you know, you can see the orbit of the comet here, 
is, you know, it comes really close to the sun and then it kind of boomerangs all the way out really, really far away. And so when we, you know, we see it, they're, they're fairly similar to asteroids, just a lot icier and they have those weird orbits. Asteroids tend to orbit a little bit more regularly. So we can fly all the way around this thing. It is rendered. We can actually land on it too. So why not? Let's go land on Comet Hale-Bopp. We're going in close. Whoop. We're coming in hot. So as, as with most bodies in the solar system, it's got lots of uh, craters, lots of little craters. But here, this is what it looks like from the surface of a comet hurtling toward the sun. Um, the, re the reality is, you're, you know, this is rendered, so you're probably going to see it look a lot. If you were on the actual comet, you would see a lot more uh, dust and ice probably flying off of it. The, uh, the comet uh, Churyumov 76P, 67P churyumov gerasimenko the one that... Uh, the Rosetta mission actually uh, had Philae land on this little lander. Um, they got some really amazing pictures of what it's actually like on the surface of a comet. And it's not that different than this, really, other than the fact that it's darker and um, a little bit icier and, you know, a lot of pebbles and random things floating around. I mean, this thing is only, how much does it weigh? Uh, 10 to the minus 6, so 1 millionth the mass of the moon. 1 millionth which is not very much, it doesn't weigh very much. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't give it in kilograms. I could I could edit that to do that, but that's okay. It's tiny, it's only 61 kilometers across, and this is Comet hale Bop. I don't think this is actually mapped. This is probably a uh, rendered, or a um, procedurally generated thing, right? I don't think Comet hale Bop was mapped, and the thing is, is that you know if you're really far away from it, you can barely see it because of the coma when it's close to the sun. And then when it's far, far away from the sun, you don't really see it at all anyway, so. Because it's dark and small and all that jazz. But there you go. So it's this tiny little thing that's giving us off tons of gas and dust. And as it gets closer and closer to the sun, it, it loses all that stuff. Uh, in the chat, that detail, is it real based on what they're able to observe or artist simulated? Yeah, I think it's it's a bunch of textures that the creators made. It's not the real thing. Um, there is a, you know, I can actually turn on real objects. And so procedural objects are things that are made by the software. Real objects are, of course, real ones. Um, but if, if you go close to anything, it will be procedural. It will be simulated. Um, so like we can go to, you know, any star you see in the sky, we can travel there which is kind of cool. And a lot of them have procedurally generated planets and you know, we we can go to other galaxies. We can do all kinds of stuff. And we are going to do that cuz it's fun. I one of the, my favorite things to do with this software is to actually go and just find a random star and look and see what the planets are like there. And so we might do that. But for now, we're going to go back to Stellarium. Go check out the comet Neowise over the next couple weeks. You don't need a telescope. Binoculars will do just nicely, and uh, if you're going to take some photos of it, put your camera on a slightly longer exposure so that you get the full tails of the comet now that you know what uh, what they actually do. And I lost the comet, but that's okay because we're going to go a little bit later tonight and see what else is up in the sky, starting at about 10.30. 10.30 is a good time of night because it's not super late, so people you know aren't quite in bed yet, depending on you know how late you like to stay up uh, but some people are but most people wouldn't mind staying up to see something cool uh, we can see our Big Dipper constellation of Ursa Major right there there's the Big Bear looks like a bear too but we're trying to see some of the the interesting things to actually look at in the sky and one of the most interesting things that are up right now or rather two of the most interesting things is that if we kind of fly around swing around to the south Oh, hello, we've got two planets there. We've got Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter and Saturn are typically both up all summer. And now that we're right into July, you know, they're rising right at sunset. Uh, about a month ago, you'd have to get up at about one o'clock in the morning in order to see Jupiter and Saturn. But now um, they're right next to each other. I think Jupiter next week is at opposition, which means it is opposite um, or the Earth falls between the Sun and Jupiter, which means Jupiter will get a little bit brighter as the sunlight reflects directly off of it. So let's let's center it 
And Jupiter looks nice here in Stellarium. You can see the moons. Um, the cool thing about the moons is that as time goes forward, you can actually see the moons orbiting the planet, which is kind of neat. Like if you come back tomorrow, look at that. The moons are now in a different spot. They actually orbit on the order of days. Uh, apparently a new storm was found on Jupiter recently. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the clouds of Jupiter are very chaotic. And so there's always, you know, no, there's no storms that are as big as, as the Great Red Spot, the one we see here. But a smaller storm, maybe the size of this little dot there, uh, was discovered by an amateur astronomer. Now, whether it lasts a long enough time for them to actually take good pictures of it, who knows? Because sometimes uh, you get storms rise and fall over a period of months or years or even, uh, well, centuries in the case of the Great Red Spot. That's probably not going anywhere anytime soon. And all of that happens because Jupiter is spinning so quickly. A planet that's about 10 times uh, the diameter of the Earth. Jupiter's really big, but it also only spins in about nine hours, just under 10 hours, actually. So imagine something that big spinning uh, more than twice as fast as the Earth. All these clouds are going to be swirling around really, really fast, going all over the place. And I think we'll, we'll use Space Engine and take a closer look at Jupiter, because uh, Jupiter's really nice. One of the great things about Space Engine, we have a little search function. Um, first, first thing I'm going to do, actually, is go back to today. Oh, that's the normal time speed. Okay, that's today. And so Hale Blop is obviously not where we're looking at right now. It's much further away from the sun. It doesn't look very nice in the sky because it's tiny and incredibly distant. But let's go to Jupiter. And we'll just press the G key and we're going to take a nice slow ride to Jupiter. I'm going to be silent for this and we'll turn the music up so you can enjoy it. Okay, we've arrived at Jupiter, and this is the beautiful thing about Space Engine is that we can just swing around it as much as we want. We can see some of the blue cloud tops higher up in the atmosphere. This is based on, um, or sorry, this graphic is based on recent imagery of Jupiter, taken from the Juno space probe. Um, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. By a long shot, it, it's, it weighs as much as all the other planets combined, and a bit extra. You'll notice most of the storms kind of fall along the cloud bands north and south of the equator. And all that really has to do with how fast the clouds are moving. Um, clouds along the equator have to move faster because they have to cover more distance than the ones that are, are further down. And that difference in speed creates a swirling called the Coriolis force. And we can swing all the way around Jupiter. And we can even take a look at some of Jupiter's 79 moons. If we swing away a little bit, you can see a couple of them right there. There's Europa, one of the places thought to have life. We've got a nice view of the galaxy, the Milky Way in the background. It is uh, our big sibling protecting us. It's a good soundbite, Heather, from your interview. As we move a little bit closer, I think this is Io. No. Nope. Yep, that's Io. One of the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. Ah, uh, yes. Say I should. Say, thank you for uh, prompting the science, right? Uh, say why Jupiter is protecting us. Jupiter has, uh, because it's so big, it's got a lot of gravity and a lot of angular momentum. So as any rocks from the outer solar system or outer space come close, trying to get into the inner solar system, uh, Jupiter's gravity gives them a kick. Or rather, its angular momentum, a little bit of it gets transferred to those small rocks, and they go flying out of the solar system. And so in a way, Jupiter shepherds all of these other rocks coming into the solar system and says... Yeah, you can't stay here. And actually, that might be one of the reasons why life was able to thrive on Earth. Is that without these big rocks hurtling inward and destroying 
whatever life was on Earth, often, Jupiter protected us, and perhaps it's the only reason that life could flourish the way it did, the way it has. So there's Jupiter. By the way, you know, in, in chat, if there's anything in particular that you want to see, or if any of our viewers, other than my good friend Kaluna Carbon, want to say hello, you're more than welcome to. I do appreciate the chatting, to be honest. I love um, actually doing the interaction. Um, this is kind of why I do the streaming and why I've, um, when I do a live stream with a, a or a private stream with a school cl uh, class or a, a group of girl guys or scouts, it's a lot of fun because they ask constant questions and say, hey, can we go here? Can we go here? Can we see this? Can we do that? And so I love that kind of thing. So please don't be shy. All right, so let's go back to Stellarium and see Saturn because Saturn's also in the sky. And if Saturn and Jupiter, it's kind of hard to choose your favorite, you know? I like them both for different reasons. I love all the moons of Jupiter being right there, very bright, very easy to see, the Galilean moons. Um, but at the same time, you can see Saturn up in the sky. Um, I say this a lot, but there's a distinct difference. You know, without the without these labels up in the sky, it could be hard to tell that these are planets, right? Well, the secret is uh, to finding planets in the skies that the planets aren't twinkling. Stars twinkle, planets don't. And it's mostly because they're much closer to us. Um, the rippling of the atmosphere uh, doesn't affect planets like it does stars. So there's Saturn. Let's go in closer. And of course we know Saturn by those big rings, and it's actually very nice that the rings are tilted a little bit compared to the rest of the solar system. That lets us see the light reflected off of them. Saturn has a lot of moons as well, actually more than Jupiter now, 82, I believe, and counting, including some of the larger moons like Titan, Tethys, Rhea, Dion, and Enceladus, another place where we might find some life. Now Saturn looks absolutely gorgeous in Space Engine, so we're going to come back and go take a nice short trip over to Saturn. Although I've set the go-to to be about 30 seconds, so we'll take that, well, 10 seconds in this case. <laughs> it's the short go-to, but that's okay. We're going to go just to Saturn a lot faster. And here we are. Well, it really takes you in close. Um, but yeah, this is Saturn. We can actually bring up the label so we can see what all of these little moons are or at least some of them. Uh, we can bring up the rest of them too. Uh, dwarf moons, there you go. So we can see what some of these, these little ones are. Prometheus, Epimetheus, Atlas. Uh, those are the moons that shepherd the rings. If we come in really close, Atlas and Daphnis. Let's slow down a little bit as we swing along the rings. Uh, Jen says, Ryan, I heard some noise about a passing asteroid soon, as well as moving the magnetic field. Can we discuss these? Sure, there is an asteroid. I, I heard about this um, in the news. There's an asteroid that's um, pretty big. I think it's uh, a couple hundred meters across. I'd have to check that, but uh, heading close to Earth. Um, that's not uncommon. I mean, if you if you could see all the rocks that were up around us in the sky... Uh, your mind would be blown. They're just, they're everywhere. But luckily, any big rocks are tracked by the Canadian Space Agency. Actually, NASA does a lot of it, but I say the Canadian Space Agency because a lot of the, the best asteroid, meteor, uh, rocky tra body tracking in the world is done in southern Ontario. Um, at the University of Western Ontario. Now, I'm not just shamelessly plugging that because that's where I did my master's, but they do. Um, they have a huge planetary science group and um, are very good about uh, finding those, those big uh, meteorites that happen and talking about them, and, and they track a lot of asteroids as well. Um, but there is a worldwide group of people who tracks all these bigger asteroids to make sure that you know if they are going to come close to the Earth, is there a good chance that they're going to hit us? And if so, how do we deal with that? And luckily, even though this asteroid is coming very close to the Earth, probably within the distant, the orbit of the moon, I'm not quite sure, which puts it at about 300,000 kilometers or so, chances are 
we're going to be just fine. It's going to go on its merry way and we'll never see it again. So these happen often, but they're, they're somewhat sensationalized with the titles. Um, they're often talked about as if like, oh, hey, this huge asteroid is coming by and nobody's talking about it. Well, yeah, we're not talking about it because it's not really a big deal. It's not dangerous. So there you go. So that's the asteroid. Um, as far as the moving magnetic field, I do know that the Earth's magnetic field is technically moving north. Um, or closer to Russia. I should I shouldn't say north. It's technically the North Pole. Um, magnetic north is is moving closer to Russia. It does move all the time. And um, thanks thanks for that, Heather, in the chat. Um, it does move all the time. The magnetic field. Um, let's just take a quick hop over to Earth. We'll come back to Saturn. I promise. It's really easy to do. <laughs> given our year well you know what i was talking about just the this morning was that oh hey was that the comet that might have been the comet so we might go visit that um one of the things i was just talking about this morning was how uh on halloween this year we're getting a full moon like doesn't that isn't that just icing on the cake right like if there's going to be a a zombie apocalypse or if the gates of hell open up it'll probably be on halloween during the full moon in 2020 um so yes the um the magnetic field of the earth is shifting it does move all the time and you know it's one of those things where if you're not paying attention to it you don't really care about it you don't really notice but every so often you get a headline that says hey the magnetic field is moving and we don't know why again that sensationalized headline of you know hey something might be really wrong here you should be afraid or you should worry about this don't worry about it at all I'll tell you when it's safe to worry but yes 2020 needs to take a take a chill pill <laughs> needs to ease off the gas a little bit um but hey we just got to be happy with what we do have even though this year has been crazy count your blessings help other people that's all you really need to do and try to keep positive you know there's there's so many ways to be negative and so many so many things that invite you to be negative about everything that's just not worth the energy. More cats, why not? All right, so we're back at Saturn and it's many, many moons. So let's fly around a little bit. One of the things I love about the rings of Saturn is that really, as big as they are, about 100,000 kilometers across, they're super thin. You can actually lose them if you go at just the right angle. They're about 100 meters thick, which sounds like a lot, but when they're 100,000 kilometers or 100 million meters across, that 100 meters of thickness isn't really that much. Let's go surfing along the rings a little bit. And let's, uh, we're going to take away these labels. As nice as they are, they kind of take away from the cinematics of the scene. And see, this is what I love is this this scene can we learn more about hyperion i don't know much about that moon it is uh hyperion is a sponge <laughs> basically that, I'll, I'll show it to you actually i named my computers um after hyperion my, my computer in grad school was named hyperion yeah it's actually very um it's got a lot of holes and it looks kind of like a sponge so we'll, we'll go take a look at it but let's go surf the rings you notice there's a gap in the rings as well this is called the cassini gap the reason that there are gaps in the rings is because of some of these tiny little moons. The gravity of these moons pulls on all those little bits of ring particles, creating the gaps. And we're going to go see one of those moons right now because I can see one just up ahead in the outer ring. Okay, let's slow down a little bit. So that is the moon Pan. What a great name. Let's go in a little closer and see Pan. And you can even see the little kind of streaks of ring acting like tiny little moons as they orbit planet Saturn. Pan is a really funny looking moon. It looks like a spaceship. There it is. <laughs> what a great, I'm gonna pause this. We can see all the ring particles flying by, but it's nicer when we pause it a little bit. This is actually what Pan looks like. This little moon that looks like a tiny version of Saturn. Doesn't that just look like 
you know, a child looking like the parent. So that's pan. Let's start time again and we can watch. The rings do orbit Saturn like tiny little particles. <laughs> you take the luxury spaceship to Saturn, huh? It would be pretty nice to surf along the rings. These little bits of ice and look toward this massive planet looming in the dark. Even the sun shining through the rings looks nice. Let's go take a look at Hyperion, that moon. Hyper, Hyperion. Okay, we've selected it. We're going to take a nice slow go-to as we fly through the rings. Overstuffed hamburger, that's a good one. I like that. Thanks for chatting, keeping me company. I mean, I can talk to the microphone all day, but it's much nicer to talk when you know that there's actual people on the other side. And who knows, maybe someday we'll end up with more than two or three people tuning in. There we go, so there's your sponge of Hyperion. Potato works too. Um, I'm going to lower the exposure a little bit too so we can get a better, better view of it. Yeah, like that doesn't that look like something you clean dishes with? Yeah, most likely impacts. There's also some thoughts that it's a very um, a very loose collection of rubble and doesn't have much density, which is why the impacts are very deep and uh, really kind of drilled into um, into the moon. You'd call it a moon. It's much more of an asteroid. Let's go land on it. Because that's one of the nice things. It's just like you can see how, how uh, spongy and porous it is. Now, you know, of course, this is rendered. This is not, you know, real imagery. It's based on real imagery, but we're going to land and it's going to render a little bit. There you go. There you go. This is life on Hyperion. Can we see Saturn? That I think that's Saturn. Yep, there it is. Oops. So there we go. That's Hyperion. Moon. One of Saturn's 82 moons. Now, I, I think I saw the comet in the inner solar system. So maybe Space Engine actually updated with the comet. So let's look it up. C22. Oh, it does. It does have Neowise. Look at that. I didn't even have to bring up Hale Bop. Let's go, oh, object not found, okay, there you go, go to. All right, we're gonna take the 10 second hop all the way over to Comet Neowise. Forget seeing it at night, here it is. Can we land on it? Sure, why not? Whoop. Now, as you can see, again, it's it's pre-rendered, right? So this is, uh, we'll adjust the exposure back up. Um, I'll start far away from it again so you can get a sense of just how small the comet itself is compared to the coma and the tails, that's the coma, and the two tails. Now you can see the, see the tails are much more spread out because this comet is moving away from the sun. Again, it's actually moving in this direction toward the blue tail that you see there. So it's moving away from the sun. And so what happens is, even though the ion tail is still always pointing away from the sun, this dusty tail that you can see here, the dusty one, because the comet is moving kind of down into the, the left of the screen, the dust is all starting to fall behind it as it travels. So the tails are actually quite far apart. And that actually makes it a lot nicer to photograph too. So yeah, let's go land on it. Uh, let's center it. I gotta slow down substantially so I don't crash into it because that wouldn't be very fun. Yeah, we're going in really, really fast here. We gotta slow down a bit. That's one of the hardest things to control in this software is, yep, there we go, I flew right by it. It's traveling too fast. There we go. <laughs> so that happens. There we go, slow down. Yeah, it's a great piece of software. Like I discovered it about three months ago, and I'm just producing so much content with it because it's fun. So there we go. This is Comet Neowise. It is... 
four and a half kilometers across, so quite a bit smaller than hale -Bopp, which was about 60. It weighs 10 to the 10 tons, so it's like a mountain. But here we are. This is, and you can see kind of the icy structures as we land, nice and, well, a little bit hard. That's okay. Let's climb this mountain over here. Let's go up this mountain. Yeah, mostly mostly good friends and nice people tuning in. I occasionally get some random people. I actually did really well when I was doing YouTube streams, but Twitch is kind of a new a new thing. All right. Well, you know, what do you what do you want to look at? I mean, we can go back and look at some more things in Stellarium in the sky or we can just go and putter around in uh in Space Engine. I'll tell you what, we'll see what else is up in the sky and we'll come back to Space Engine and spend a bunch of our time just kinda another galaxy? Sure, yeah, we can do that. I'm gonna come back to let's come back to Stellarium and just work our way back so we can see the night sky. It's important to remember that, you know, although there's a lot of fun things to see in these this software, it's no substitute for the real night sky. Jupiter and Saturn toward the galaxy in the south. The bright red star Antares, often mistaken for Mars, but remember, stars twinkle. And so uh, that one's going to flicker. It's not going to be like Mars, although it is red. Um, one quick thing, Jen, I think you'll appreciate this. I was thinking of you when I posted this today. Was um, Let me bring it up. Um, on the YouTube channel, Heather and I actually made a how-to video for the Space Club. Yeah, he would be saying moon. Wouldn't, Lucas would be loving the moon. Um, so I, I'd love that you guys join the Space Club. This, uh, this how-to video shows you some of the things that you can do um, with SLU. Uh, I don't think we're going to wa watch it live, but it is posted on the channel. You can go and watch it. Um, so, uh, But I, I think of Jen because she joined the club with Lucas. Um, so they could they could have some fun and the moon is one of the first quests that you can do um, That's really really cool that we talked about so hopefully that'll help you um, use it a little bit All right, so back in Stellarium Heather Kaluna carbon you want to see another galaxy What's this guy here is that Andromeda no yeah, it is there's Andromeda up in the sky, but there's also um, the one I usually look for is the Whirlpool, which is a really nice one that's up at, in the summer. Um, and one of the cool things about the Whirlpool galaxy is that you gotta love the, the boundaries of the image in Stellarium. One of the great things about the Whirlpool galaxy is that it's actually um, post collision or sort of mid collision. It's this beautiful spiral galaxy and this other galaxy that is interacting with it through gravity over millions of years. So tell you what, let's go take a look in Space Engine <clears throat> and let's go visit the Whirlpool. We're just going to select it. We'll do a slow go to, which is actually really fast. <laughs> Jeez. Or is the whirlpool grouped with that galaxy? Oh, the other galaxy, I think, is a, is a Messier object. Or may, maybe not. It, may, it might be a new general catalog. Object. It's technically a separate um, object. I'm just going to turn off a few things. Oh, there we go. So this is the this this other galaxy. Yeah, it's new general catalog 5195. So it is technically a separate object, a separate galaxy. Um, but the whirlpool looks really really nice. Um, hard to spot in a telescope because it's so far away. And we're just going to go right inside the whirlpool. Let's aim for one of the the spirals in the whirlpool. As we close in, what because this is, um, oh, were they able to track them hit each other, or have they always been together? Um, they've 
always been together. I mean, they uh, galaxies interact over billions and billions of years. I mean, if we could see millions of years into the future, you would see these two galaxies interacting, right? Um, the real, ch you know, the challenge is we don't live that long, <laughs> but we know that these are two distinct galaxies. You know, you can see the two cores of them. Um, it's very like likely that the smaller one is some kind of elliptical, dwarf elliptical galaxy that was pulled in by the bigger spiral. And as they interact over time, I mean, the, the world, the smaller one might tear apart the whirlpool as it gets kind of swallowed up. Um, through gravity, those, these these interactions are so uh, involved and so difficult to predict and and math out because you're dealing with billions of stars, hundreds of billions of stars all interacting together. So let's go into the whirlpool and see what we can find. Oh no, I did it. I'll slow down quite a bit. There we go. Okay, let's go in. And we're going to look for like a nice nebula or star cluster within the galaxy. As we get into the disk, what we call the disk of the galaxy, that's where the bulk of the stars are. How's the audio level, by the way? Hopefully the music isn't too loud. I want it. Even though, oh, even the video I've seen of what it might look like over many, many years of Andromeda hitting the Milky Way, yeah. That's that's the same kind of thing, right? Is the when Andromeda hits the Milky Way. Oh, you don't hear the music? I wanted to turn it up a little bit. Oh, that's so weird. How about now? Okay, good. So I just had it too low. I want to have a little bit of background. So it's not just me talking in the silence. <laughs> it's nice to have some, a little bit of audio. Okay, so here we are in the whirlpool. Look at that, this is the, there's the core of the galaxy over there with all the gas and dust. Let's pick a star. Okay, that's good, thank you. Now I'll make note of what that level is. So let's go down further. As we see all the stars race past us. We get into the thick core of the galaxy. Ooh. Look at those big filaments of gas and dust that go into forming new stars. Are there any interesting things around? Any clusters? Uh, well, let's keep looking. Go through some of these gas filaments. See if we find anything neat. Oh, there's a big blue star over here. Let's go take a look at this. The cluster we imaged the other day. Okay. That's probably in our own galaxy, in the Milky Way. Oh, here's something cool. There's a big... But we can definitely go to that if you'd like. Let's go in a little closer. Okay, so this appears to be... Probably a globular cluster. Yeah, this is, um, by the way, the RC designation in the top corner, that means that it is procedurally generated. This is not a real object. But this is what a real globular cluster would look like. Lots and lots of stars. And if we go way up close, we can actually fly right through this and see that globular clusters are, are thought to be what's left over of ancient galaxies. That galaxies were formed by all these smaller ones, these little clumps of stars merging together to form the big ones that we see today. Imagine the chaos. And all that's left, or thought to be left, of these ancient galaxies is these tiny globular clusters, clumps of thousands upon thousands of stars stuck very close together. Are stars still bor being born inside of it? Not likely. Most of these stars are a lot older and red. There's no gas or dust. But imagine living on a planet around a star within this cluster. What would your night sky look like? 
we're going to go in a little bit further and then we're going to answer that question. We're going to look for some planets. In fact, one of the nice things about um, about uh, Space Engine is that we can look for planets with life. There is life in this universe, in this simulated universe, so why don't we look for any life? Um, oh yeah, lots of life in this in this cluster. Holy smokes. These are all procedurally generated. Just, just to note that none of these are actual real planets, but um, 16 planets, two which have life. That's kind of cool. Two moons that have life. Um, K-class star. M5.5 is a good one. So let's select that. And we're going to go there. This is a star within this globular cluster. That has two planets that have life. Are we there? No, we're still... We're coming in on it. Oh, it's a binary red dwarf. So it's two tiny red dwarf stars. You can't quite see them yet, but we're going to get in closer and they'll start to appear in the center frame as we close in on them. Caldwell 75. Okay, we'll do that one before we're finished. There we go. We're closing in on those those stars. These are the two. You can just see them there. Um, one of the great things we can do um, is actually see a chart of how this system is built. Look at these. These are the two red dwarf stars. They're so small. One one hundredth the mass of the sun. One tenth the diameter of the sun. There are planets that are actually bigger than each of these red dwarf stars that orbit each other. It's a complicated system. These stars orbit this empty point. This is the Barry Center, the center of gravity. Uh, red dwarf stars are typically very, very low mass, light, but, but dense, very compact stars. They're the, basically the smallest thing that be, can become a star. They are very tiny. And actually, they're the most common stars in the universe. Um, whoops, too close. These two are orbiting a point between them, and they each have their own planets that are very close, and there's a couple other planets that are very far away. And if I had to guess, I would bet the planets that have life are some of these ones in here. That has 11 moons. I think, I think it was a moon that had the life. But you, you can select any of these. Um, and see some information about them. These are all generated by the computer system. Jupiter's a failed star. Yeah, Jupiter would have to be about, uh, I think about 20 times as heavy as it is um, for fusion to happen. So if Jupiter was 20 times as heavy as it is, it, it likely would have become a star. Most star systems are actually binaries or triples. So most stars actually form in pairs. They're, they're twins or triplets or quadruplets. Our sun is actually really rare um, in the way that it, it it's on its own. It formed on its own. And so Jupiter would be maybe that second star in our system if it were quite a bit heavier. So where was the one with life? The best way to do that is to look at a slightly different view. Okay, the one with life is around this star. It's um, one of the moons of this tiny planet. This one over here. Not go too slow now. Too fast, I should say. So the moon of this planet has life. There it is. Yeah, that's the moon, B7.1. So this is a planet with multicellular organic life, subglacial, which means it's below a hard layer of ice. Let's go there. 
and see what it would look like to some life on this planet looking up in the sky. There it is. This is a planet in the universe, inside a globular cluster within the Whirlpool galaxy that has microbial life. It's not real, but it doesn't mean that planets like this don't actually exist. Let's go in close. Now, the whole surface of this moon is illuminated because... Oh, we're getting a little bit choked up there with the computer. That's okay. So look at this. this the, the whole planet is bright because there are so many stars in the night sky that it just brightens up the whole place. Imagine your night sky looked like this. Stars everywhere. This is one of the things I love about Space Engine is that we can really just explore the universe and see that there's so many diverse environments, so many planets. There are planets out. There's more planets out there than stars. Why aren't they this, this diverse? They could be they those planets could be gas giants, but they could have moons that have life. Those moons could be surrounded by asteroids that are constantly pushing that microbial life around from star to star. But let's let's fly out. Let's fly back home. At least to our own galaxy. As we go faster, we start to see all the stars slowly fly past us. And we see how dense that cluster is. The reality is, in, in real life, it might be hard for life for any advanced life to survive in an environment like this. You saw that planet had life that was below a, a thick layer of ice, shielded from the radiation of all these stars. But if there was intelligent life, it probably couldn't thrive in this kind of environment. Just so much radiation from the nuclear engines of those stars. As we fly out a bit faster, we can again see the galaxy, or galaxies, of the whirlpool. And let's look back toward the Milky Way. Ooh. <laughs> all the way over here. It'd be kind of hard to find without all, with all these other galaxies out here. It would be cool if we could travel like that. I don't know if you noticed the speed on the screen, but we're going at uh, 16, 13, yeah, 13,000 light years per second. That is a, a stupidly fast speed. And still we're just barely, if you look in the top corner, barely covering the 24 million light years distance to the Milky Way. So let's speed up. This time, every dot that's flying around us is not a star, but a galaxy full of stars. Hundreds of billions of them. With their own planets, moons, asteroids, comets, and maybe life. But in all this empty darkness, you can't help but feel good about finding our way to our home. As big as it is, the Milky Way is still home. So let's look up NGC 6124. There it is. It's over there. <laughs> Let's go. We'll take a nice slow, slow ride there. As we fly back into the Milky Way, 
at least what we think the Milky Way looks like. It's kind of hard to tell what our galaxy looks like from the outside. Or from the inside, rather. So there we go. This is the cluster that we took a picture of uh, just a couple days ago. It might have been yesterday. Jeez, time flies. Two days ago, I think. Um, in the Space Club. <laughs> I'm not worried about it, Heather. But I do understand that I need help from people who are better at these things than I am. At least the social media stuff. But I'll take whatever help you offer. I'm usually pretty modest. I, I do this because I love to talk about space. Um, one of the things I said when I did the first stream that I ever did was that um, I was doing streaming because it was the closest thing to being able to talk about space you know, without having the planetarium. I'm used to being with, you know, 60 kids inside the big dome and interacting with them live and showing them all that stuff. Interacting with people over the internet on a Twitch stream is a little bit different. <laughs> I'll take whatever help you have to offer. I love this part of the audio track. Yeah, we'll make it something great. Until I have to tell people to stop, to stop chatting so I can answer one question. <laughs> it's a nice looking cluster. Um, I don't know if you know this, but most stars actually do form in clusters. And then over time, kind of like this one, they, they spiral out as the stars slowly move away from each other. So all these stars that were born together are now spreading out into the galaxy on their own. The sun was actually thought to be born in a cluster with most of the stars in the Big Dipper. Oh, thanks, Jen. Your voice is so soothing, you could do meditations. I think it helps to have a good microphone and uh, put a little bit of uh, roughage in the voice, you know. Yeah, Jen, where do you want to go? Uh, I got, you know, a few more minutes if you want to go visit anything. You could visit a star, a planet, a nebula. Let's go and see what it's like on another planet. You meditate daily. That's really helpful. It's very good um, for mental health. To kind of calm your mind with all the noise that's going on. Want to be on Mars? You got it. Let's go back to Earth. And Mars is a fun place to visit. Let's turn the music down a little bit. I forgot to turn it down. <laughs> Jen says, yes, especially want to be on Mars right now. That's good. You know, maybe there is a market out there for space meditation. I know I'd be into it. <laughs> there you go, there's Mars. Um, when, I'm going to back up a little bit because... Um, you can see the two moons of Mars. Um, <laughs> I hate to tell you, no, it's not very calming, but the names of the moons are Phobos and Deimos, which mean fear and panic. <laughs> not very meditative. Space meditation app, huh? But that's okay. Yeah, we, we might find Arnold here. I think that was like in the late 80s. Man, that was a good movie. Total Recall. But yeah, here's Mars. Um, Mars has ice caps. There's the, the pole. 
where that's actually water and carbon dioxide ice. Let's go, let's go land there. Let's go explore the surface. We have really good surface maps of Mars. Due in part to all the landers and rovers and, whoa, let's slow down a little bit. We don't want to go too fast here. Mars does have an atmosphere. Ah, reasons why we meditate, yeah, indeed. All right, slow down now. As we get a bit closer to the surface, the, the rendering gets a little bit more wonky, so I'm gonna stay above the surface a little bit, but hey, look, there's the comet. That's what it looks like from Mars. That's kind of cool. What good? What a nice, uh, a nice boost. And if we zoom in, we uh, we can actually treat this like a telescope as well. Um, and if we center on it, we can actually. There you go. That's what NeoWise looks like from Mars. I'm gonna screenshot that because it's a nice one. <laughs> so if there's any Martians out there. They're probably enjoying the comet too. Although chances are, I, I hate to tell you, it's probably not bright enough to see because the sun is up, right? Um, one of the things this software does really nicely is it makes everything a lot brighter so that you can see it. At least the objects in the sky. Let's go up and investigate some other parts of Mars. It's about half the size of the Earth. It's not a huge planet, but... Yeah, I'm sad you can't get it from Mac either. But if you ever want to just stream and um, you know have a call and we can play around with this if you want to investigate more or you can just you know wow okay that I'm gonna stop pressing buttons for a little bit <laughs> see this is one of the tough things about the controls sometimes I think we must be at the North Pole of Mars which is why it's being a little bit weird <laughs> that's funny Favorite planet, eh? All right, let's get out of here. I think I know what the problem is, but yeah, we're rotating with Mars, that's why. All right, let's go higher. Some of the, There are some clouds on Mars. They're a little bit pronounced in here, so I'm gonna turn them off. Uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned about meditation because I did try to choose some audio tracks that were really calming and relaxing because I'd love that kind of feel of you know, kind of exploring the universe in, in this really relaxed, meditative fashion, you know? Like, have some calm music, just enjoy the sights and, and see what's out there. That allows focus on your voice, huh? All right, let's go in closer and... Is it true the moon is younger than we originally thought? I did see some news about that. Um, it is about 85 million years younger than we had originally thought, um, which is a, an update, not a huge difference compared to the four and a half billion years old, uh, year age of the moon. Um, but one of the, so here, let me go to the moon as we talk about this. Um, one of the interesting things about the moon um, is that there was this period um, called the late heavy bombardment and that's where you know the moon there was a lot of w when the solar system formed there were a lot of extra rocks left over asteroids and comets and, and boulders and mountains all flying around and most of those rocks ended up uh, hitting everything in the solar system the earth they hit the moon and so this is this is a period about three billion years ago. Here we go. There's the moon. And so this is where most of the big craters formed on the moon that we can see here. Most of them, I say, but like this is the uh, oh, it's the basin on the south part. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but that's a big crater, right? And all these smaller ones happened during the late bombardment, late heavy bombardment. Um, well, one of the things that researchers are, are looking at is, is when did the late heavy bombardment actually happen? And as they narrow that down, that gives us a little bit more of a sense of how old the moon really is. And so uh, a recent paper that came out, you, you saw it in the news, obviously, Jen, is that the moon is, they've updated the age of the moon by about 85 million years, which is about... 
about 10, about one, well, say two or three percent of a difference from how old we thought it was before. So not a big difference, but a measurable difference. There's a nice shot. Let's take a screenshot of that. So this is our moon. Oh, um, you're asking there's a blip. What is that? Maybe back when we were looking at Mars. Oh, the major impact? Um, which one? This guy here or the one I was looking at previously? Um, I don't know a heck of a lot about the impacts on the moon. This is, a, I think this is the south pole of the moon. Um, I can't remember what the name is. It's, it's something basin, but I, I can't remember. Oh, the first one at the top? <laughs> it's kind of hard to to do it when you're, you know, you're over chat. Um, I think that's Tycho there. This is a this is one that's on the the what you'd call the dark side of the moon. Um, the reason that they're dark though, uh, the the bottom of this a sad squished face. That's good. I like that. The reason that they're dark at uh, some of the bottoms of these these bigger craters um, and basins uh, is that a long time ago when the moon was very young, um, even these these dark regions up here, they're called mare. Mare is Latin for seas. Um, Tycho isn't a major impact, the darker ones are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Tycho is a big impact, but it came much later than these other ones. Um, this impact down here, you know, it's it's dug right into the beneath the surface. And a long time ago, the moon had molten rock underneath the surface, magma. So these impacts dug so deep that the magma filled up the craters. And when that lava magma cooled down over millions and billions of years, it formed this dark, smooth rock that we can still see today, even though there's been other craters. You can actually see, like, inside this giant basin, there's other impacts. And so that's why when we look at the face of the moon, you know, if we look here at our side of the moon, like if we go... Uh, let's let's go forward in time so we can see more of it. Actually, I'll do you one better. I can just illuminate that part of the moon. So, like you see, this is the side of the moon that we we typically see. These are the mare, these big dark regions, and that's where the astronauts landed. These are ancient impacts from huge, huge rocks. These craters filled up with lava. They cooled down, and that's what we see today. And then all these little craters came later. All right, so I think I'm, I'm more or less done. I am going to go outside probably in the next hour to take a look at, at Neowise. But I'm going to take us back to Earth. I did record this stream as I do all, all the streams I take. Um, another question from Heather. It gets hit so often, have we ever imaged an impact? Well, I hate to tell you, most of those impacts that we saw, uh, those, those craters on the moon, um, most of them happened during that late heavy bombardment era about three billion years ago. However, we have actually had images of a tiny impact on the moon, maybe something the size of a boulder. And I think it was actually only a year or two ago that we saw something the size of a boulder smash into the moon. And I, actually, I think it was during an eclipse too, which made it a little bit easier to spot. So imagine that. And it, it was uh, because it, you know it's, a, it's like a nuclear bomb going off, you could actually see the flash of light from it. If I find it, I'll send it to you. I'll take a look and, and you know, the earth looks a little weird because it had no clouds. <laughs> so we can turn those back on. But I think we're going to end the stream here. Um, I want to say thanks a lot for tuning in. We have three viewers, so I know Jen's there. I know Heather's there. And whoever our third viewer is, thank you for tuning in as well. Um, feel free to say hi in the chat whenever you like. We're going to try and grow this whole thing, I think, and see if we can get more people in on this stuff. But until next time, we'll talk again. Clear skies to all of you, and have a great night.